hysterectomy, as we all know, is a long-term endocrine pressure reduction. Uh, but however, it does not end with the surgery. The post-operative management is actually critical to the outcome and is more challenging to do than the procedure itself. Now, this is in brief what Manish had initially discussed, but I'll be restricting myself to the high intraocular pressure, what can be seen sometimes in post-operative patients after a good trap. Now, whenever you have a patient where the pressure rises post trabeculectomy, you have to look at two things, the bleb appearance and the anterior chamber. Now, when you look at the bleb appearance, you could have a low bleb or a high bleb. Now, if you have a low bleb, that indicates that the aqueous is not coming out through the ostium into the subconjunctival space, and there's something wrong inside the eye. So it could have, because of the external factors, like what has been described, the two tight sutures or subconjunctival fibrosis or internal sclerostomy obstruction. Now, if you have a high bleb where the echos is coming into the subconjunctival space, that indicates it's a tenon cyst. Coming to the next differential diagnosis, you also look at the anterior chamber depth when you have a high intraocular pressure. Now, now again, depending the phase, the post-operative phase, uh, when the patient <coughs> presents to you with a high intraocular pressure, if he presents immediately to you following your trap, that is within the first week, the most likely diagnosis is either tight sutures or internal osteum obstruction. If the patient presents after a few weeks, probably a couple of weeks, it's most likely a teen and cyst. And after four weeks, as Dr. Mayuri described, a late blip failure. Now coming to my topic on teen and cyst or encapsulated rep, it can occur even when you use anti-metabolites. Though it has been described in the earlier phase, but it can occur when you use anti-metabolites too. Now the clinical features, usually when you look at the bleb, it's an elevated and a very localized bleb. The pressures are high, the anterior chamber is deep, and you have to do a gonioscopy always just to rule out any obstruction, less likely in these cases to rule out an internal obstruction. This is just an incidence of all the past studies and varies anything from 3.5 to about 30% in the studies as such. Now what are the risk factors, what are the increased incidence, how this is uh, lip, uh, encapsulation can occur. Younger the age, as we all know, have more thick tenons, so most likely to develop a tenon cyst. Male gender has been described. In the past, they said when AIT was performed, uh, those patients were more likely to develop uh, encysted blips. And one more important thing which I would personally like to highlight is the glove powder. So I always wash my uh, gloves uh, after I drape and all, so that the powder gets washed off, or you can use powder-free gloves. Because my personal experience, I had a series of insisted blood, and following this precaution, I it reduced considerably. So let's start with the clinical discussion. This patient who might operate it was a 68-year-old male uh, of a primary open hand glaucoma. On maximal therapy, the pressures were 28, and that's when I decided to do a right eye trachotrabeculectomy with mitomycin. I usually do a separate incision trachotrabeculectomy. On the pulse, first post of it, the bleb was diffused, the anterior chamber was deep, and pressures were what I actually wanted to achieve, the 10 millimeters of mercury. The patient was put on routine post-operative medications, that is prednisone, acetate, and cyclopentolate. Now, whenever a patient is operated for a trap or a phaco trap, you have to just, it's just not the pressure you look at. You have to lift the lid. You have to look at the bleb. As Dr. Manish said, you have to look for signs of serials also. It could happen in the immediate phase if you have a buttonhole. So, so whenever you check the pressure with your fluorescein, at that same time, you can check for serials too. You have to look at the appearance of the bleb. As the previous speakers have highlighted, you have to look for this vascularization, the height, the thickness of the bleb. Everything is important. So the first signs which might just start uh, uh, like telling you a telltale thing that there's an increase in blood vascularization which starts usually from the periphery as you can see all around here gradually it's encroaching then the blood starts getting localized it becomes elevated but getting very localized and a circumscribed appearance and this results in a gradual rise in pressure so as soon as your pressure starts rising like I started with a pressure of 10 and it starts drifting away that means there's something wrong which is happening okay. And this is what happened actually to the patient two weeks post up. It was a like one peanut out there and very well localized and a thick tenon's wall and the IOP shot to 26. I've done the gonioscopy just to look at the osteum also, which is patent out here. So what is the first thing I would like to do at whenever I see these things happening, kind of or the, the pressure drifting away? I always take a releasable suture in all my patients 
and then the first thing I do is release the suture so that that immediately helps you to kind of lower the pressure and hopefully the aqueous comes out and kind of things settle down if it's just a tight suture or a steroid response or something. The se second thing, if I feel you know, it's getting quite localized and elevated, that means we are heading towards the tenon cyst. The thing is you do a bleb massage. So you tell the patient to look down and around the bleb you can kind of massage it. It kind of helps in hydrosecting the bleb and probably kind of flattens. And these are mostly hypothetical situations but sometimes it works as such. I taper my topical prednisolone and probably would go to fluoromethylone because I just wanted to rule out a steroid response partly which is adding to the uh, rise in pressure. And then I would start the patient on uh, aqueous suppressants, which is one of the best modalities of treatment in uh, encapsulated blood. So you can start with Timol, and if there's a contraindication, you could start with dorsolamide and closely follow up these patients on a weekly basis. So this is a, a releasable suture just to show you and how do you do it on the slit lamp? You look down and with the sterile forceps just gently pull it and the bleb gets elevated immediately, more diffuse bleb out here. And after that, in spite of that, if the patient is basically, the pressures are not coming under control, so now the delimide, do we do a conservative line of treatment or do we be more aggressive? And this will be dependent on the severity of the glaucomatous damage, the level of intraocular pressure, and the response to the conservative medical treatment. So if the pressure is within tolerable range, then you could have a situation where the tenon cyst is developing, but the pressures are not too high, probably you might just observe or at the most uh, put on a single medical therapy and the digital massage might just help. So the initial approach is you reinitiate medical therapy. It's like treating the primary open and glaucoma step by step, add one drop at a time. Okay, reduce your steroids, mostly the powerful steroids. You could go for more, more of surface steroids like chloromethylone and digital massage. Now the outcomes usually, most of the times, the intraocular pressure often decreases. It stabilizes gradually over the next three months and remains sufficiently reduced to avoid any further surgical intervention. And they've seen that a success rate of almost 70 to 90 percent with just medical line of management has been achieved. But 50 to 60 percent of these patients still require lifelong medications. So you might have done a tap, but they are not off medications. Almost 50 percent require continuous medical therapy to maintain the target pressure. And this is just to show you the success rate which I've been described. It varies from anything about 50 to 100 percent. That means almost all patients were treated medically and they uh, could achieve the intraocular pressure control. Now, if the conservative management fails or if the pressures are highly dangerously elevated, that's when you might have to think about a surgical intervention. And the surgical interventions are either needling, as Dr. Kaushik has shown us, or ultimately excising the bleb. That's if the cyst wall is too thick and you tried needling and it's just not, uh, it's recurring, that's when you might have to do it. The needling, as she uh, mentioned, we I do perform it in the operation data under local anesthesia, not topical anesthesia. Uh, to reduce the bleeding incidence, you can use phenylephrine drosin prior to taking up the patient, so the way constriction reduces the bleeding. I always use a 25 gauge needle. It's a longer needle, so I can go a bit more away from the central area, and it's a bit thicker needle, so it gives me a more cutting uh, advantage as compared to a 26 needle. And uh, you could do multiple punctures, or you could do more of a slicing effect, where you know you actually cut those layers of the uh, tenons. Now, in this case, you need not be too aggressive by going under the scleral cap and into the internal osteum as, uh, as you can, you have to do that when you have a complete bleb failure. But in this, you are restricting yourself to the superficial area on the subconjunctival space and hence less chances of uh, bleeding or uh, uh, lens touch or iris touch as such. Now, surgical excision of cyst should be considered the last resort when there is vision threatening, visual field loss, uh, uncontrolled IOP and the patient has not responded at all. But there is a risk of post-operative hypotony and the tenon cyst can still occur. Uh, I have no experience with uh, surgical excision of the cyst. Luckily, I have never had to, but this is what I have seen from Dr. Mandel's article where uh, this is a, a tenon splegit and you uh, cut the conjunctiva at the same side where you have taken your previous incision, uh, uh, undermine the uh, conjunctiva and identify the cyst, apply the tenon, uh, sorry, the mitomycin splegit all around and then you cut it and this is what the tenon cyst looks like as such. Now, invariably, most of the time, in spite of medical treatment or needling, the blood tends to flatten and kind of fails, goes into kind of a late blood failure. And that's when you might reconsider uh, uh, doing a needling, a late needling, or if you feel, no, it's not possible, you do a retrabeculectomy with mitotomycin again, and rarely you might have to do an amadoval. 
blood uh, encapsulation can occur with any other procedure too and this is my personal experience with patient of uh, amadwal which i had inserted patient had undergone a complete band buckle for uh, his retinal detachment and i had to put in an amadwal the patient did well for two months and two months later as you can see you can see the exact boundary of the amadwal usually you have a blip out there and you can't see the boundary so this is like it's hugging the amadwal so this was a thick tenons which encroached the entire wall and the blip failed and uh, i tried uh, flushing this uh, tube out there and in spite of that it opened temporarily on table but the next day again it flattened and the pressures were high and ultimately i had to open up this conjunctiva go to the tenons cut the tenons and ultimately there was a tenonectomy which was done and we could achieve a good blip as such so uh, just to uh, long term prognosis is relatively good it represents basically represents a high blip phase in the early post operative period it is self limiting and usually self resolving and hence conservative approach is usually recommended thank you thank you